Hey guys, I am way overdue for an updated video about battle belts, but here we are. The reason it took so long is that I wanted to get some time on this, the new Defense Mechanisms Mech Battle Belt. And also, I don't really use battle belts very much anymore, so it took me a while to kind of gather the data and even just get some footage for it. That's probably going to be a really big point of discussion for this video. What is a battle belt good for? When might you actually want to use one? Both of these are the two layer style of battle belts, the Defense Mechanisms Mech Belt and my uh, trusty Blue Off of Gear Molly Belt, which means that they have a Velcro inner belt that goes through the belt loops on your pants, and then you attach the outer belt system over the top of that. There's also the typically much beefier padded war belts that don't have an inner belt to interface with. They just have a big pad around them, which provides some cushion and a little bit of friction to kind of keep it in place around your waist. Beyond that, there's the even bigger jungle belt, which is very similar to old school Alice style web gear. So lots of pouches, a big waist pack, probably a suspender or Y harness system to help manage the weight. Not sure if you guys remember those, they were really popular on Instagram for almost two entire weeks before everybody forgot they existed again. So that's the way that I'll use the terms battle belt, war belt, and jungle belt. I think that's probably the most common way to do it, although I'm sure you'll hear some people who just refer to any type of belt system as a war belt or a battle belt. Uh, I don't think anybody talks about jungle belts anymore because like I said, Instagram, two weeks, that was months ago. We don't talk about that shit anymore. So first things first, what is a battle belt for? In my opinion, the purpose of a battle belt is to carry and support a handgun. So that's going to limit its appeal to situations where you really want to have a handgun on you. A lot of guys talk about the concept of first, second, and third line gear when talking about battle belts. That's not of particular interest to me from a civilian perspective. I tend to think of it kind of the other way around. So instead of thinking about which pieces of gear you ditch first until you, you know, drill down to your first line that's left over at the end, I think of it in the other way. It's the gear that you slowly add on as the situation demands. So from my perspective, the battle belt is most useful when you intend to be mostly just using a battle belt by itself. So in a sense, I guess you could think of it as your first line gear. It's the first thing that you put on. Now, whether that's because you're in some sort of a, a static security or homestead context or whatever it is you're doing, you're hanging around camp, you're just going about your business and your perceived threat level is probably still pretty low. So mostly what you want to have on you is a handgun for self-defense, some ammunition for that handgun, and since you've got extra belt real estate, you might as well have some medical supplies on there. Your next level of escalation beyond that is to grab a rifle. So if you have a spare rifle magazine or two on your belt and you grab a rifle, well, now you have a little bit of support for that rifle and you still have your handgun, ammunition, and medical to fall back on if you need it. If you know stuff is getting really bad and you've got the time, then you throw on a plate carrier or other LBE so you have significantly expanded capacity of ammunition, medical supplies, tools, whatever else. And beyond that, if you know you have to go somewhere, you throw on a backpack and now you've got everything that you need. Just speaking for myself, if I knew I was going to put on all of my gear and go somewhere, I would not want a battle belt because I probably really wouldn't want a handgun. If that's the case, I'm going to want to dedicate that space and weight to more rifle ammunition, and there's better ways to carry that than on a belt. Also, we're probably going to want the option of putting on a plate carrier, and at least, in my opinion, plate carriers and battle belts kind of don't play super well together unless you've got a super slick plate carrier. And a relatively slick plate carrier probably makes a lot of sense if we're thinking about this from an escalation context. If you start with the battle belt because you're just wandering around the homestead or hanging out at camp or in some sort of a security, static security environment, most of the reason you're putting on that plate carrier is for armor and a few extra magazines. So a flat pack full of extra gear or a hydration bladder or a whole bunch of high tier comms equipment is probably really not what you need to have on that carrier anyway. And that's the issue that I have with battle belts. They create a lot of interferences and also they get in the way of layering. And so for me, a battle belt is kind of a one season piece of gear. There we go. I know there are some guys out there who have figured out how to wear a rain jacket and all of their warming layers under a battle belt. I just cannot figure that shit out for the life of me, probably because I have a short torso and everything just overhangs too much. 
three seasons out of the year, if I want to wear a battle belt, that means I have to tuck a hoodie or a fleece jacket into my pants, put the battle belt on over it, and then decide if I want to wear a rain jacket and create a huge amount of interference with the handgun and magazines, or ditch the rain jacket and then freeze to death later in the night. So that's certainly something to consider. If you're in an area where you have to wear a lot of layers for warming and water protection, then you may consider either not using a battle belt at all, or maybe that's a reason to go for a war belt, which can go on the outside of your jacket. The interference with a plate carrier is also a problem, at least for me, I have a relatively short torso, so my belt line is very close to the bottom of my plate carrier. It makes it kind of tough to draw magazines without getting them bound up on the plate carrier. Also, I can't easily twist or move or bend over. Same thing with a handgun. If it's high up on the belt line, it might be pretty difficult to draw when you're wearing a plate carrier, not just because of the interference of the handgun going straight up into the side of your plate carrier, but also perhaps because your mobility or flexibility is somewhat reduced when you're wearing armor. If you want to maintain compatibility with LBE, chest rig, backpack, plate carrier, whatever, then you're probably going to want to put some sort of a drop system on your holster. Maybe not too much drop because then your uh, handgun becomes very floppy and doesn't stay in position very well and becomes even bulkier. So that's something to consider. We'll talk about that when we get to holster stuff. And the last point of interference with battle belts is that putting a bunch of gear around your waistline tends to make it very difficult to get into and ride in a vehicle. All right, let's talk about battle belt selection. These two belts kind of represent the two predominant styles of belt. The defense mechanism's mech belt is relatively slick. The blue alpha belt is a molly style belt, so it has a somewhat PALS compatible webbing on the outside to attach pouches. Pouch attachment is going to be one of the big differences between different types of belts. There are a bunch of different ways to attach pouches. You can either just use like uh, belt slide, you know, typical belt loops. You can use uh, molly attached using the built-in molly straps that are on the pouch or attached using malice clips or WTF straps. There are also a bunch of different pouch attachment clips from G-Code that'll work on different styles and thicknesses of belt. And then what's becoming increasingly common is for people just to attach pouches using Velcro one wrap and just have it interface with the Velcro on the back end of the belt. This defense mechanism's mech belt is somewhat a hybrid style because the way that they've sewn on the Velcro on the inside of the belt, it does have some regularly spaced channels where you can theoretically run uh, malice clips or molly straps. Uh, I don't think it works very well. Molly is already kind of a difficult proposition when it comes to setting up battle belts. One of the main issues is that battle belts aren't really thick enough for true molly. So what you have is half height sewn loops and you have a slightly less than a full size gap between them. So molly straps, malice clips, WTF straps, they either bunch up or you have to skip basically over the entire set of, uh, of molly rows. So what you're, what you're losing out on is the whole point of molly, which is that the very, very tightly woven nature of, of uh, PALS, pouch attached ladder system. It's a ladder system, right? It's like a, it's like a or lattice, actually. Uh, it does stand for ladder, but it should stand for lattice. This is a terrible tangent to go on. But uh, it's, think of it like a, like a lattice top pie, delicious pie. <laughs> That's, my God, we're really off the rails. And when you weave uh, molly or pal straps or whatever through each other, they become extremely uh, solid. There's just no chance for, for movement or shifting. Um, even if there's nothing actually like, like no snaps at the bottom of it or no like way to tuck the straps in, there's just so much like fabric to fabric contact that they're rock solid. And that's not the case with battle belts. Uh, these pouches here are attached with malice clips. I had them previously attached with WTF straps. Uh, does, doesn't really matter though. Either way, when you go to draw magazines out of here, there's enough retention on the magazine pouch that you pull the pouch up and it slides up and down uh, because the molly is not super tightly attached. And that is frustrating, and that's probably one of the reasons why I think I'm sort of leaning away from molly belts, generally speaking. Attaching pouches with Velcro one wrap, which is what we got going on with the mech belt, doesn't really seem like a high-speed solution, but it's actually quite elegant. The advantage is that when you loop your one wrap around on the back side of the belt, then you basically just have more Velcro hook on the back side of the belt, which engages perfectly fine with the loop Velcro on your inner belt. So unlike using uh, big plastic clips or belt slides or anything, you don't cost yourself any Velcro engagement. 
Yes, I do realize from the hundreds and hundreds of comments on the last video telling me that you can put adhesive Velcro on the back of plastic belt loops to give more Velcro engagement with the inner belt. Uh, yes, I know that's an option. You should read the comments before you write a comment. Anyway, another change we're seeing with a lot of battle belts now is the integration of Tigris or Tegris, which is that horrible carbon fiber looking bullshit that's just disgusting and it shows up everywhere. But I got to admit, this belt, the Defense Mechanisms Mech Belt, is probably as rigid or more rigid than the Blue Alpha Gear Molly Belt, despite being way lighter and thinner. So, yeah, all right, Tegris looks awful, and I, I just wish I could unsee it forever, but damn, it actually does a pretty good job of, uh, of making for a very rigid belt that doesn't weigh a lot and is, and is still pretty thin. So both of these belts are set up with basically the same arrangement of pouches. This is kind of like the default. It's like if you don't have any idea of what you're going to do with your battle belt, you can just set it up like this and it'll probably work out for you. So remember, our first objective is to carry a handgun and support a handgun. So we have, of course, a pistol holster and then we have two pistol magazine pouches. If you've got a modern duty style handgun, three magazines is a pretty solid amount of ammunition. Pistol on the top belt is a Walther PDP SD Pro, so that's three 18 round magazines. The pistol on the bottom is a Glock 19, so could be three 15 rounders, three 17 rounders, could be a 15 and two 17s, a 15 and two 21s, whatever. You can carry extended magazines if you really want to push the ammunition capacity more. Remember that the way I'm thinking of it here is when we put the battle belt on, we are intending to use the handgun as a primary weapon, so carrying rifle ammunition is kind of secondary. On both of these belts, I only have one rifle magazine pouch. I'm also a skinnyish person with a relatively small waist, so that does limit the amount of stuff that I can stack up around the perimeter of my body. You may have a little bit more belt real estate, so perhaps two rifle magazines would not be an issue for you. For me, it's kind of pushing it. And since it's not the primary goal of the battle belt, in my opinion, I'm okay with just one rifle mag. We also always have medical supplies on the belt because if you think you might get into a shootout, you definitely want a blowout kit. These are not super full featured first aid kits. They are more like blowout kits, stuff to treat immediately incapacitating wounds. So essentially treating major bleeding. So tourniquet, uh, wound packing gauze or hemostatic gauze if you've got the money for it. Uh, chest seals also, even though I know that uh, a sucking chest wound is apparently not really an immediately incapacitating wound, more like a problem that develops over time, but whatever, you got, you got some space, so go ahead and just cram a few of those in there. I prefer the IFAC to be positioned at the 6 o'clock, right at the very back. That way it's accessible equally from either hand, although this is not necessarily for self-aid beyond just the tourniquet itself. I have experimented with sticking a tourniquet pouch in front of the holster. A lot of guys have weird attachments that attach a tourniquet to the front of the holster itself. I just hate the way that that gets super bulky and I don't even like having this here, so I would probably want to uh, run basically a little tourniquet hammock or something underneath this IFAC so it's a lot more like this one. And the last thing that both of my belts have is a dump pouch. These are pretty useful, even if you don't think you're going to be retaining partial magazines. But then again, sometimes that really comes in handy. Go, go, go. Oh, you're, you got one more, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, wait, this is why you stick the partials back in your oh, uh, dump pouch. Work certified, baby. <laughs> yeah, still in the fight. Dump pouches can also just be useful for picking up anything that you find on the ground that you need to grab, or just for stashing stuff that you don't really want to hold in your hands, but you need to keep on your person. Also, when it comes to holsters, I think that a retention holster is a very good idea. It's not like we're necessarily concerned that someone is going to try to snatch our handgun, but we really don't want it to fall out if we got to run around or do something or, you know, climb around or get into a weird position, particularly if we're thinking of this as something that we wear while we're going about our daily tasks. There are some non-retention holsters that still have more than just friction going on. Some of them are kind of like snap fit. You know, the handgun will snap into place. Uh, certain G-code, certain uh, T-Rex holsters are kind of like that. Uh, if the holster is just friction to the point where the gun will just slide up and down, uh, I would say absolutely not acceptable for an outside the waistband holster. When it comes to retention holsters, I think Safari Land ALS style holsters are still unbeaten. Honestly, not even threatened by any other holster on the market. There are plenty of other options out there that maybe will give you better handgun compatibility with your weird hipster handgun of choice, like this Walther PDP. And I know that it's really hard to find the actual Safari Land holster that you're looking for because their website is a thing of Grecian tragedy. But 
That being said, if you just bought a Glock like a normal person, you wouldn't have any of these problems. For increased comfort, ease of draw, decreased chance of interference with uh, anything on your uh, body, you probably will want to run your holster on a bit of a, a drop and offset sort of uh, platform. This one is, I think, essentially a mid-ride holster. This is a Dara level two holster. Uh, this one does not drop down far enough that I feel the need for a leg strap. This is a Safari Land, uh, I think that's a mid-ride. I'm pretty sure it's a mid-ride UBL. That one does uh, drop down a little bit farther and I do appreciate the leg strap. Same thing if I was gonna use a Safari Land low ride or anything of that nature. The leg strap on this one is the a and Designs Vasta system, which basically just positions the leg strap farther down than it would be if you tried to run it through just the bolt holes on the UBL. I find that particularly useful. Uh, I have a short torso, but I have very long girthy legs. So being able to extend the thigh strap down a little bit farther is pretty nice. There are other ways to do that. Uh, I think there is a swiveling system from Arbor Arms that you might find especially useful. One of the issues with uh, drop leg holsters is that a lot of the times the actual drop system is very rigid. So when you move your leg, the holster wants to stay exactly where it is in relationship to your belt line. Uh, that can be particularly uncomfortable, especially if you've got a long drop and you've got a thigh strap that's uh, even farther down. So the swiveling thigh strap is kind of a nice upgrade or if that becomes a real problem, then yeah, just consider moving the handgun back a little bit up on the belt line. Uh, a low ride is probably not that necessary, even if it does make the draw a little bit easier. A lot of that's gonna depend on your body mechanics and uh, proprioception, I think is the term. You can probably tell that I don't use my battle belts that much anymore because this is a red dot Safari Land holster, but I don't even have a red dot on my Glock anymore. So uh, it really just gets in the way. Although you can take these hoods off really easily and then, you know, it's basically just works like a normal Safari Land. So I'm going to go quickly over the pouches that are on each of these belts. This one is predominantly just defense mechanisms because they sent me this belt and all of the pieces that go along with it. So this is their double pistol magazine pouch and one of their rifle pouches. These are attached via a uh, Velcro one wrap. And this is their uh, little dump pouch thing, which collapses up inside of itself. And also this is designed to attach, you know, behind or using the same Velcro or straps as your magazine pouches. So the dump pouch doesn't take up any additional belt real estate. Pretty nice if you're trying to get more gear on there. And also it just kind of keeps it out of the way. Um, plus you don't have to reach back as far to access it. That being said, I don't really like this dump pouch very much. Uh, the mouth of the bag is like really, really narrow. So it seems like this is more designed for um, I don't know, evidence gathering or something perhaps, where it's like you want to grab small things and get them in there, but you really don't want them to fall out again. Whereas my theory behind a dump pouch is more to just store crap uh, or partially empty magazines. That's also an additional problem because re-indexing re is not super easy on these mag pouches because they're super soft. So uh, yeah, uh, the mag pouch doesn't re-index very easily and the mouth of the dump pouch is really narrow. So. Hanging onto a parcel magazine with the, with the uh, mech belt system, not as easy as, as maybe I'm used to. This medical pouch is also from Defense Mechanisms. Uh, this is basically just a, an elastic sleeve holding onto this medical insert. These little tab things here don't actually do anything. They are just there to grab the pouch more easily. This is a pretty nice device because you can yank it out really easily and then you have uh, access to all of your stuff in here. So we got chest seals, um, a uh, flat trauma dressing, and then two slices of uh, wound packing gauze. Not hemostatic because I'm not made of money. There is no super easy way to stick a tourniquet on here. So you would just want a little like tourniquet dangler or some other additional tourniquet pouch probably if you still wanted the tourniquet at the 12 or 6 o'clock which I would, but that's just me. This pouch is a direct action tourniquet pouch that I'm going to take off. Uh, these pouches are really excellent, well-made, and they can attach to basically any surface you want. You know, belt, molly, horizontal, vertical, whatever. Uh, still, I don't really like the placement of it, so I'm not gonna keep it on there. The holster is a Dara level two holster, uh, which is one of the only holsters that I could find that was a retention holster for the Walther PDP with a weapon light. Uh, I'm gonna have to talk more about retention holsters in the future. This one's kind of weird. I don't really think I would recommend it. Unfortunately, when you're trying to find a holster for a weird handgun, 
you kind of got to take what you can get. This belt is still pretty much the same way that we left it with uh, a few minor substitutions. So the uh, mag pouch is an S-Tac Kiwi. This is the two pistol, one rifle. This is not the gap version. They're just no gap between the two pistol magazines. These are for Glock style pouches. Uh, these have the Kydex inserts, which means they retain their shape and also hold onto the magazines pretty strongly. Downside of that is that these are attached with malice clips. And that means that the, uh, the pouches slide around quite a lot. So when you go to drag, uh, draw the magazine, then the retention causes the whole pouch to start to ride up until it reaches the limit of what's allowed by the malice clip. And then the magazine comes out. Uh, quite frustrating, but it was also frustrating to have them set up with uh, WTF straps. So, yeah. Annoying. Probably going to replace that with Velcro one wrap because it turns out that's a great way to go about things. So just behind the two pistol, one rifle is a Coyote dump pouch, Coyote Tactical Solutions dump pouch. Uh, nice dump pouch. It's a good shape and size. And also it rolls up really nicely. This is also attached by Malice clips, but it doesn't matter because you're not pulling anything hard out of that thing against retention. So totally fine. At the six o'clock is the Coyote Tactical Solutions Burrito IFAC, which has a uh, this little homebrew medical insert in here, typical stuff, as well as a uh, little like tourniquet hammock integrated into it to hang the tourniquet at the bottom. Uh, this can be attached with a couple of different methods, but right now it's just slid on there with the, uh, the little belt loops. This is definitely improved over their previous version that had really thick belt loops. Uh, these ones are thinner, so they don't cost you as much. Velcro engagement, that's right everybody. Under the holster, this is a Safari Land 6394, 6356, 2649. I just made all those numbers up. Who fucking cares? This is a level one ALS holster, so it only has the uh, little thumb lever to defeat the retention. It does not have the snapping hood. This little hood here just protects the red dot sight and articulates out of the way as you draw. Uh, but you could always just pull it off if you didn't have a red dot sight or you just you know, didn't want it to get in the way. Also, Sometimes they just fall off on their own, so kind of an issue there. Um, these do come with like a big expanded wing thingy over the top to try to protect the gun from uh, people grabbing it from the front. I just take those off because I don't really care. I'm not really worried about someone trying to steal my gun. I'm mostly worried about my gun falling out. So yeah, there you go. Those are my belt setups. They are quite boring and I'm okay with boring because I don't actually really like using these all that much. Shooting with a battle belt on the range is quite fun. Uh, having your magazines that easily accessible allows you to reload really fast and you look really cool doing it. And that is certainly fun. Uh, if you want something that'll pull double duty as sort of, you know, preparedness or tactical gear and you know, some like competition style gear, then a battle belt's a pretty kick-ass way to do it. If you're a very cool dude, you're about to go out and do some direct action stuff, then a battle belt in conjunction with a plate carrier probably is a good way to maximize your potential loadout uh, for, you know, a short-term mission. But overall, I still don't think a battle belt is a good first piece of gear to invest in. I think they have a pretty niche application. So I would say you should probably start by getting your concealed carry system squared away. And if you're looking to expand into load bearing or tactical equipment, then you should get something that predominantly supports your carbine. And that would mean a plate carrier or a chest rig before a battle belt. If you just want to be able to throw something on to quickly expand your plain clothes loadout, then you might want to consider something like these G-Code Scorpions with paddles. You can just stick some mags in these and then stick them onto your regular belt. These even actually conceal pretty well under most jackets, and they are not going to require you to uh, put on a whole ass belt system and become very overt. So that is something you can just toss into a bag or have in your vehicle to expand your ammunition carrying capability on short notice. Also, you're probably going to be wearing combat pants or cargo pants or something like that, and you can fit quite a lot of stuff in your pants pockets. So instead of having a whole battle belt set up, I could have a holster that attaches with a paddle system. This is a G-Code mule system with an adapter for another Safariland ALS holster. This works significantly better with layers than a battle belt does. Then tack on a couple of paddle attached magazine pouches that can even go underneath your outer layers and uh, stick a small blowout kit or IFAC into your cargo pants pocket. 
That gets us pretty close to the capabilities of a battle belt, although we're not gonna get the same kind of speed and stability out of these uh, add-on pouches as we would out of a full-on battle belt setup. Anyway, that's basically all that I've got for you guys today. I am going to take down the old battle belt video, but I will have a link to it in the video description if you wanna watch it for posterity or to potentially glean some more information out of that video. Uh, it's really not super up to date anymore, so I don't know why you would necessarily, but you know, somebody is definitely going to ask where that video went and if they can see it again. So I'll just make it easy for you. Something's fucked with this upper, man. As always, if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. If you like this channel, obviously you should subscribe. And if you want to support me more directly, you can do so via Subscribestar. There's a link in the video description. I'll see you guys next time.